Welcome everyone to FarmCast for the community for the University of Georgia College of Pharmacy. As you know, I'm your host, Dr. Tim Brown. And I have to tell you, as we've gone through the COVID and we've looked at various things with the pandemic, as we were planning on moving this podcast to a monthly podcast for the community and to answer your questions, one of the areas I continued to read about was how all of us are not going to seek care. So in other words, instead of going to see our primary care physician like we normally do, we, at, we are sort of putting that off because what's scarier than going to a physician's office when everybody is sick and you're trying to avoid being sick? Also, what that means is that a lot of people aren't necessarily taking their kids or their children to their pediatric visits and their primary care visits. And here we are back to the school year and school is starting all over. So what should you do? Do you take your kids in to see the primary care and the pediatrician like you're supposed to? Is it safe? What's going on? Well, to help us answer some of those questions today, I have Dr. Renaud Abasawa, who is a clinical assistant professor with the University of Georgia and also the College of Pharmacy, located on the Augusta campus. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tim, and I'm really excited to be here. I do think this is great to get the, the information out um, in an area that I'm very interested in, which is pediatrics, obviously. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be here. Wonderful. Well, now, okay, just so the audience knows, give me a little bit about your background because you work in pediatrics, but to get to this level of practice, you had to go through quite a bit of training. Right. So um, let's see. So my journey started at the University of Florida. Go Gators. Um, I did a bachelor's in nutrition as well as my doctorate of pharmacy there. Um, and then I decided to do residency training. So my first year I went to Rochester, New York, Florida girl up in the snow um, at Golisano Children's Hospital. Um, so that was exciting. And then I did my second year pediatric specialty residency in Texas um, at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. And as you alluded to, now I'm here in Augusta. Um, in addition to um, be teaching at the University of Georgia, I also teach at the Medical College of Georgia, as well as I practice at the Children's Hospital of Georgia and the Pediatric Neurology um, Clinics. So that's a little bit about me. Very nice. I, I don't think a lot of folks realize that when we say the word pharmacist, a lot of people think about community pharmacists. And, and I've walked down this path in these podcasts before, but you're another example of someone who certainly got the degree in pharmacy, but then went beyond that and received advanced training to take care of the little ones that are out there. And also neurology, which means dealing with the brain and the spinal cord and all that. So you're really, really smart. Oh, I don't know about that. I try. <laughs> well, we're pleased that you are, had time to join us today because I really wanted to bring in someone who could speak to kind of our fears about taking our kids back out in public again, yet... We're sending them to schools in certain areas. So tell me a bit about COVID and all the stuff that's been going on. Have you seen a reduction in visits to your clinics or have you changed your, the way you see patients? Right. So inevitably with COVID-19, um, many hospitals, including our own, have started to adjust how we interact with patients. Um, my clinic is a little bit unique because it's embedded within the Children's Hospital, and um, we actually see patients in a variety of different ways at the moment. So we do have patients that are coming in for their um, in-person clinic visits, um, although the number of those patients um, are less. Um, as well as we do offer uh, telemedicine in terms of like video platforms as well as phone call visits for those sure. patients who are more comfortable in that um, in that way of communicating um, and so we are trying to offer alternative ways to allow for patients and their families to feel comfortable coming in to see us because we do still think it's very important um, but unfortunately I will tell you um, myself and other healthcare providers that I work with we are noticing a concerning trend kind of like what you alluded to that many of our patients are not um, coming in to their regular doctor visits due to this concern um, and that that obviously brings some other concerns because especially with my patients they're very medically complex and they have other um, diseases that need to be managed on a regular basis um, and so we would encourage them to continue to um, come to those clinic appointments in any capacity that they can. So let me ask this question give me an idea of the age age range that you care for. 
<laughs> so that's 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 a funny uh, question. So, and the reason I say that is because it's a little bit odd. Um, so pediatrics generally is anywhere from one day of life to 18 years of age. However, in um, the pediatric world, especially in specialty areas like neurology, cardiology, we tend to hold tight to our patients and we have a hard time letting them go. So I actually actually see patients as young as one day old and as old as I think right now 55 might be the oldest. Wow. Um, and I feel, I, to be honest, that's around my age. I feel pediatric certain days. So I get that, you know, that's good. So, so let me ask this. You, you said this earlier. You do tele, telemedicine or you see people online, those kinds of things. But mm -hmm. the area that I'm reading about that has me the most concern as I think about kids going back to school is vaccines. And I know there's a big debate, should I vaccine my child or not? I'm not even going to walk down that path. I'm just going to talk about the fact that the majority of, of school systems and colleges do require vaccines. And then secondly, we know that certain vaccines do stop diseases from yeah. happening. We, we have data for this. We know it. Yes. So tell me a bit about our, there, there's no way you can do vaccines telehealth though. It's not like you can give a shot through the computer. No, we cannot give vaccines through a computer. Technology has gotten us far in medicine, but not quite that far. Um, so again, this is one of those scenarios where it is important to take your, your child to their well care visits and to get vaccines. Um, we know it's unsettling to go to a hospital or a doctor's office um, because you're trying to avoid contact with, with people. Um, but there are certain visits that we we really recommend that you shouldn't avoid. So most importantly, that's your child's annual checkup and vaccinations. Um, as, as many of you know, vaccines are administered to prevent many disease states that can result in um, various sicknesses and even hospitalizations. Um, many of you with children know, ch um, children generally take their or get their first vaccines when they're born. Um, and then there are lots of other vaccines that are administered um, through their first year of life, all the way up until um, their high school years and even well into adulthood, as many of us will get vaccines. Dr. Abasaw, you know, as you yeah. talk about these, give me an example of maybe a, a vaccine I would get when I'm really little, I'm not just okay. born, maybe okay. a vaccine when I'm like a toddler, and then maybe okay. one that I would make sure my kid has before they head off to UGA for college. Okay, so there, let's see, so there are about 10 vaccines from the moment you're born up until about high school. Um, the first one that you usually get when you're born is um, for hepatitis B, which is a highly contagious viral infection um, that can affect children's livers um, and actually get, um, increase their risk for cancer. So that one is usually three doses starting at birth. So that's the very first vaccine that most children will get. Um, let's see, in their toddler years, um, usually for patients less than five years old, they get a vaccine um, against Haemophilus influenza type B, which is a very serious illness that's caused by a bacteria, not a virus this time. And that one actually will affect your brain and spinal cord, and it can even be potentially um, deadly or cause lifelong disability. So, so we definitely- That can be meningitis, right? That's a bacteria that can cause meningitis. Right, which is an infection of the brain. So as somebody who works in neurology, I see that quite a bit. Got it. Um, and then let's see, um, one that is probably a little later that most people are familiar with is chickenpox or the varicella vaccine. Oh, yeah. So that one, um, you usually get two doses starting at about one year of age as well. Um, and that one is a viral disease that everyone's aware of. You get the itchy rash blisters. Um, that one can be serious, especially in patients that are vulnerable. So children or patients who have other disease states. Right. Um, and then the one that we most commonly think about before they go into high school or college is the meningococcal vaccine. Um, and that one, they it's two doses, like many of these. You start at about adolescence and um, it protects against a bacteria called Neisseria meningitidis which is also a potentially fatal infection of the brain and even the bloodstream. I, so, I just love the fact that your pronunciations are like amazing. I would just say it's this big old bacteria that gets in the brain and causes some infection. So, you know, you just named a few of them. I mean, measles, right. mumps, there's uh, what we call right. whooping cough. There's yeah. strep. So right. there's, there's a boatload that mm -hmm. if you don't show up for your well child visits, you kind of fall behind. Mm -hmm. So if you fall behind, let's say, my kid was due in June and I didn't want to take them out because of everything going on. Right. Now I know they're going back to school. How, how do I catch them up? 
I mean, what do I do to like, do I, is it, is that, are they just done for life? They can never get them again? Or how does that work? No. So um, it does require a conversation with a healthcare provider because it is going to likely be depending on how many vaccines they've missed, how old your child is, um, and which vaccines they are. It can take anywhere from one month to several months to catch up all on all their vaccines. Um, and some of them can't be given together, et cetera. Um, generally, if they're younger patients, there's probably going to be more vaccines that they missed at any given point because we have a lot of vaccines that are given at two months, at four months, et cetera. Um, and then that tends to be less, there tends to be less vaccines as patients get older. So it might be quicker for them to um, kind of catch up. So, um, it's really interesting. so let me ask, so that means it's really important if you have a newborn or an infant or a toddler, there's mm -hmm. a lot of vaccines in there up to about the age of five or six. So mm -hmm. those are the folks that really we've got to focus on and make sure that we get them caught up. And they're right. not school age yet, but it will throw them off when it, it's time to be school age. Okay, I'm making sure I'm following along, okay. Um, the other thing to consider too is in um, some states, including the state of Georgia, um, pharmacists can also give vaccines. So um, you can probably give a call to the pharmacy that you go to, to um, get medications and see if they um, would be willing to give your child some of their vaccines. If you have some you know, concerns about going to the doctor's office um, or you're already going to the pharmacy for whatever reason, that potentially could be an option just because there are variations, I would call them and ask them ahead of time. I was gonna ask that exact question. So, okay, so we've talked people into going now, right? Everybody's like, okay. I got it. Dr. Abbasala okay. said this is very, very important. I need to get my kid in. Right. Are, are offices like your office, are there ways that they're trying to, mask? are there vaccination days? Are we just trying to do catch up days? What are we seeing out there in the pediatric world and the primary care world to sort of answer this problem of not getting the vaccines? Right. Um, so that's a good question. I do think that it depends on the, the uh, institution that you're going to. So I know as a pharmacist who works in a clinic and in a hospital, I will always check to see if my patients are up to date with their vaccines and if they're already coming in, whether it's unfortunately because they're in the hospital or if they're coming in for any other type of clinic visit, I try to get them in and be like, you're already here, let's go ahead and get your vaccines if you need them. Um, it, it really does vary depending on um, the institution. I always uh, recommend that um, patients reach out to their primary care physicians or their pediatricians for their children um, because most pediatricians are where most patients will um, get their vaccines for their, their children. Uh, and so that's the, the kind of the person I would reach out to first, but a lot of other settings, I guess, could also give you your vaccines. You just, I would just recommend that you reach out to them in advance. And I think that you, you bring this up beautifully is there might be, um, I, I'll give you an example. I worked in family medicine and we actually would have a morning that was just vaccine day. And mm -hmm. we would try, you know, try to get everybody in because moms worked and dads worked and we were trying to make it easy to get everyone in. The second part of it is, and you said this earlier, there are alternate places. Like there are some pharmacies that do this. There are some offices like pediatricians and some specialists who can catch you up. I think the, the biggest thing though is as a parent, make sure you keep your vaccine records for your kid and bring them with you so they know where the gap is if you're taking them somewhere different than where you normally go for care. Is yes. That fair? That is fair. Um, and then there's also some some states, and I believe Georgia is one of them, have a record of all the vaccines that your child gets. So sometimes we can also keep track of that on our end, but it's like medications. I always ask my um, patients and their families, did you get your vaccines? Let me know so I can update it in my records. Um, so to make sure that you don't get, you know, an extra, an extra vaccine. Um, so that that is good advice for sure. Okay. I, you know, I just, I'm sort of thinking ahead to when I take the kids in, what all do I need to bring? Like if I decide to go to a local pharmacy who can vaccinate my, my 16, 17, 18 year old, mm -hmm. and that's different than my one or two year old. It may be a little bit different in the number of, number of shots they've had over the years. So right. yeah, yeah. So I guess as we talk about getting people back into what I'll call a new sense of normal, we're talking about vaccines for pediatrics, you know, but I'm going to throw a curveball at you and say, if mom and dad are in the office, that might be a great time for mom and dad to actually ask about their vaccines as well. For because sure. Because there are some adult vaccines. Um, mm -hmm. So as a family event, if you're in your primary care office, it might be a time to ask about that too. That, is that good advice? 
That is good advice. Actually, I'll tell you a personal story. So we <laughs> we used to all, when I was a child, and even now, but before when I was still in Florida and lived with my family, um, we made getting our flu vaccine a family event. So we would all go to the family medicine uh, office and all of us got our flu vaccine at the same time. We all went through it together. Um, and then you can all go out for ice cream or something after. I was going to ask if you did ice cream after. What great parents you did ice cream after. <laughs> So oh. I'll tell you my story. Whenever I, we used to have to get a shot, my mother always took us to the local store and I got to choose a matchbox car for being Ooh. a good boy during getting my shots. So I got to choose like a dollar ninety eight matchbox car. That was a big deal back then for me. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah. So I think you bring up a really good point. While vaccines and shots and immunizations, sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, this is going to be horrible. You can turn it into something that is a little bit more family bonding and also a little bit, I guess, if you will, fun. That's a really hard term to swallow when you're getting a shot, though. The, I was going to ask you this, though. Working in pediatrics, is there anything parents can do before they bring their kids into the office to help them in terms of the soreness afterwards and, and maybe even getting a little bit of a fever as a reaction to the vaccine? What, what can we do? So that is a good question and one that I get often. Um, so I will be honest, this is this is probably going to shock some pa some parents. Um, we actually want you to have a fever. <laughs> we want your child to have the fever after the, the vaccine. And the reason for that is that's that's actually a good sign that you're the, the child's building that immunity to whatever um, you know uh, bacteria or virus that's causing the, the disease that we're trying to prevent. Obviously, if it's going to be a fever that lasts several days and you're concerned, um, reach out to your healthcare provider. That's rare, it shouldn't happen. But um, so I actually usually discourage parents from giving um, something like ibuprofen or acetaminophen, which is something that'll help control the fever um, the first couple of days of- um, Got it. So no back. Motrin, no Tylenol, no Naproxen, no Aleve. Because right. you said this really well. When you give me that that vaccine, my body's reacting by making an immune response. And sometimes your immune system reacts by having what we'll call a low-grade fever. Right. So tell folks if the fever's up above what should you seek help? So usually if it's up above about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then I want you to go and um, um, seek help. It does vary depending on how you um, take the temperature. So um, under your armpits is different than a rectal temperature. Um, but generally speaking, if it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, I want you to reach out to somebody and we can let you know if it's okay or if they need to come in. That's great advice, even for your teenagers. You know, if you, if you have a teenager that's getting it too. All right. So we've summed up the, the problems of the world today. We've discussed pediatric vaccines and catch-ups. So Dr. Abusala, can you leave us with three clinical pearls for our families and our parents out there when it comes to our kids and vaccines and trying to keep them healthy and all the stuff that's going on in this world? Right, so um, even though we, we talked about still getting out there, um, I do want to encourage all the parents um, to continue to follow the guidelines in regards to um, staying safe and healthy during this COVID-19 pandemic. So continue to wear your masks, please. Continue to social distance um, in order to stay safe and healthy. Um, and then please, please, please keep in constant communication with your healthcare provider, so whether that's your doctor, your pharmacist, anybody for, for your family's health. So that's all of you. Your primary your, care folks, right? Your right, primary right. care team. Yeah, yeah. Your little ones as well as yourselves, because you can't you can't um, stay safe and healthy and happy um, in this world right now with everything going on if your other health um, conditions are not also being managed. And then point. lastly, kind of the focus of our uh, talk today has been about vaccines. So please, please, please get vaccinated. Um, if you have any concerns about getting vaccines, please talk again to your primary care team, whether it's your doctor or pharmacist about getting vaccines for yourself and your children. Um, remember, the flu season is upon us, so you don't, that's just one extra wrench to complicate the picture. Um, so please call your doctor's office or pharmacy to schedule your vaccines for your family. Dr. Abbasaw, not only did you do a nice job with the podcast, you have led me to my segue to next month. As we, you and I have been talking about vaccines, in September, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to have Dr. Daniel Chastain on. And Dr. Chastain works in infectious disease in Albany. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be discussing the flu vaccine, medications, how it relates to the COVID-19, 
why it's important that this year more than ever, we talk about flu vaccines and getting people in the door, especially those little ones, six months of age and up, and those mm -hmm. folks who are pregnant and those with breathing difficulties. So mm -hmm. Dr. Chastain is gonna be on in September. He's gonna lead us through that process, which blends beautifully with the way you have set us up, Dr. Abasawa. So thank you so much. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. This has been lovely. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and also bring that perspective of pediatrics and pharmacy into this mix and also talking a bit about physicians and nurses and nurse practitioners and PAs, all those folks that allow access to care. So if you're figuring out what to do out there as parents, don't hesitate to pick up the phone, dial your primary care team, one of those members, and ask questions about the best access that's out there, number one. And number two, don't forget to take those vaccine records with you when you take when you go mm -hmm. in so your kid gets exactly what they need to help keep them safe as they walk back into the schools. And when I say kids, I'm talking about all those kids, even up to those that are going for college. Those are still our babies. Even though they're leaving, they're still our babies. So take mm -hmm. care of them, all right? Dr. Abbasaw, thank you again. We really appreciate your time and we appreciate you being on with us. You have given us great information. Well, thank you very much.